Thank you for joining us today. My name is uh, Valerie Brown with United Policyholders. With me today is Mark Dillman, our staff attorney. Uh, our topic today is your personal property claim and understanding insisting on fair depreciation. Uh, it's a complex topic and thank you for joining us. Uh, we hope we can answer all your questions today. For those of you, you new to United Policyholders, we've been helping disaster survivors and advocating for insurance consumers since 1991. We're not for profit, not for sale. Uh, we're funded by donations and grants. We don't accept money from insurance companies and we are just trusted and respected worldwide, excuse me, nationwide, sorry. Uh, Team UP, we have our professional staff who uh, support us. We have government nonprofit partners and we have volunteers who are previous uh, catastrophic loss survivors or consumer oriented professionals in these various fields that help, um, help us bring the programs and services that we do. On our website, we have 24-hour help. So we've got self-help publications, links to pro-consumer uh, professionals who can help you, samples, tips, and then the, uh, the workshops like today and other resources available to you there. Uh, for those of you who don't have it, our yellow book is, um, is a great tool for helping you uh, navigate your recovery. And if you'd like one, if you would just send an email to info at uphelp.org. I'd like to thank our funders today, the California Community Foundation, Rebuild North Bay, Center for Disaster Philanthropy, and Rebu Rebuild North Bay's Butte Strong Fund. It's part of the um, North Valley Community Foundation. Fine print, this workshop is intended to be general guidance only, not legal advice. Um, I am not an attorney, nor do I play one on TV. And while Mark is an attorney, he is not providing legal advice here today. So if you have a specific legal question, we recommend you consult with an experienced attorney. Um, the sponsors on our help page on our website are uh, professionals that support our work. We do not endorse or warrant their work. And as I introduced before, here we are. Um, so just a few things to recap where we are. Insurance is a vehicle to get you where you were before your loss. It won't drive itself. So this is one of our efforts to help you be proactive, to restore your assets, collect all available insurance funds, assert your rights, and ask for what you need. We don't want you to reinvent the wheel. We have help available. We have lots of disaster survivors from other disasters who are willing to provide help and resources. And this is why we exist, to make sure you have the resources you need. Our guiding principles for this and, and everything related to your insurance claim is focused on documenting the full extent and value of your losses. You wanna give your adjuster the chance to do the right thing. Don't be a pushover though. The key words are to leverage and to negotiate and polite assertiveness. And of course, getting help when you need it. Today's topics, we're gonna break this into four parts. Uh, what's in your policy? Documenting and valuing your personal property. Um, we're going to dive into what replacement cost is versus actual cash value. And then we're going to talk about one of the, uh, hopefully the, the, the biggest focus you have today is strategies to receive fair and not excessive depreciation so that you're able to capture the dollars that are due for you. Um, the first thing is knowing your, what your policy limits are. So coverage C is basically your belongings. It's what you would take with you if you moved out or what if you turned the house you had upside down and shook it, what would fall out? You will find your contents limit on your DEX page and you wanna check the dollar amounts for your contents. It's usually a percentage of your dwelling limits. Uh, you do wanna check your policy for any endorsements or extras that modify the amount of your contents. You also wanna check for sublimits on personal property items like firearms, jewelry, watches, computers, cameras, or scheduled items that add value. Uh, those are important because those are extra dollars available to you if you had those things. And here's a sample of another policy that again shows it uh, is coverage C. Uh, State Farm is an outlier here. On State Farm's policies, personal property is listed as coverage B. Uh, more standard examples have coverage that's listed like this at this breakout in this, um, this zoom in here. And so for personal property sublimits, um, these are special sublimits to policy that state the total amount the insurer is gonna pay for each category listed. However, if you had a rider on your policy, you may have additional coverage outside of these posted limits, which is why it's important to look. Um, these are not additional coverages, they're within the bounds of coverage C. 
So common limits can include for money, it can be between 150 to $500, securities 1,000, trailers 1,000, computers, electronics up to 5,000. Um, some items such as jewelry and firearms have special limits that might not apply to fire, but only theft. And so you need to look at the language and if it says theft of, you're not bound by that limit. Note in the top left and right pictures from a renter's policy, but they have similar sublimits. Okay, items that are not usually covered, as I mentioned, uh, jewelry, um, art with uh, its own coverage, those things are usually scheduled and covered elsewhere. Animals, birds, fish are not usually covered. Um, if you have a subtenant or a roommate, their property would not be covered. They would have to have their own renter's policy. A motor vehicles, with the exception of vehicles not registered for use on the roads or for handicapped assistance. Recreational vehicles. So the second part is we're going to talk about is, uh, as I said, documenting your um, and valuing your personal property. And so with this, uh, these are some strategies here. Sorry about that. Make that go away. So if you're underinsured, uh, if you know you're underinsured, please take the time to write uh, for, and ask for a full policy limits payout and a waiver of the requirement. It's always worth asking. You won't get it if you don't ask. We have a sample letter on our website that shows you precisely how to do that. If they are still insisting on a detailed inventory, gather your available receipts, photos, records, and just get help from the adjuster assigned to you to help you build that complete and accurate list of everything that you had. If you're with State Farm, you do have the um, ability to request they provide you someone to assist you with that. If you have an outside adjuster handling your State Farm claim, you might need to go up the chain of command to be able to get that person. Um, and the last thing with the documenting here in the valuation is trust but verify. Um, the valuations they put on your possessions, um, it should be from an objective source, source expert. If they try to unfairly depreciate, we'll talk about that a little bit later. I mean, there's some tips here on our website that can help you with that. And so here's some examples of what's on the website. These are the publications that you can look at. You can download all these files. Uh, we've got information on the home inventory and contents claims and a sample spreadsheet that you can use. Step one, and I know this is a repeat for a lot of you because we've covered this before. And so we're just gonna touch on these at a very high level. You're gonna start with a list, recalling room by room, topic by topic, category by category, whatever works for you to fill up that list. Make use of all the lists that you can borrow uh, from other people, use our website, use friends, use neighbors, whoever's got, and then use photographs from family and friends to have provide that, that uh, jog to your memory and photographic proof of what you had. Just be aware though, if you're using someone else's inventory list as a starting point, please remember that the inventory must be what you had, not what they had. So you need to customize it to fit your needs. Step two, adding to it. Keep a running list with you. Use those photographs. Um, visualizing the room, walking around and imagine what happened when you would open a drawer in a cabinet and open in the closet. Ask other people to do the same thing for you. People who've been in your house a lot previously, ask them to help with that. Step three is estimating quantities. Um, that's very difficult for a lot of people. So we've got a couple of tricks here that, uh, that have been used successfully in the past. Since books and CDs, things that are stackable or in shelves, just estimate what the, sh the foot of shelving you had. So if you had a bookcase that was three feet wide, six feet tall, four shelves, you've got you know, 24 feet of shelving. Um, go to a bookstore, go to a friend, ask a friend in this time of COVID, ask them to uh, measure for you what is a foot of shelving um, and measuring paperbacks and hardbacks separately because the, the dimensions are gonna be different. And then find out what, figure out what an average price per type is. And then you could do a calculation of what that would be. The same for clothing. Um, you know, if you've got, um, you know, you had items in your garage that were in bins, just knowing roughly what containers and what shelving would hold is helpful to estimate those quantities. Um, time savers on creating your list. Um, we've got our spreadsheet that you can use. Um, you can use uh, gift registry services. Um, you know, you can do a lot of this online. Target, Macy's, Bed Bath & Beyond, Crate & Barrel, um, Kohl's, Restoration Hardware, Lowe's, Home Depot, Ikea. 
all of these have um, the information online. You can build a shopping cart, print it, PDF it, and have that for this is what you had in and this is what it would cost to replace it, which is a little uh, gets you ahead on the pricing part. Um, you can also do it in Amazon online. You can build a list that spans many more categories of goods than traditional stores. Use, like I mentioned earlier, using family and friends to help you. Um, and then checking, of course, with your bank credit card company for records of previous purchases, also going to Costco um, and other stores that have a history of your purchases. That's very helpful to, to be able to provide you what you had, what it costs when you purchased it so that you can use that for replacement. And step four is the pricing. Obviously that gift registry, again, to value items on your list. Um, you know, you want the cost on what it is to replace the item now. Stay away from eBay. Um, stay away from sale prices as well. Uh, you want, if you're using the internet set of value, you want to not use sale prices because you that sale might be gone by the time you actually replace it. And you want to be able to get the full value of what that is. Um, you know, and again, contacting those companies, working with other survivors um, in 2017 when I was working down in San Diego for their wildfire. Um, some of the survivors did a pricing party where they just got together and they were able to swap. And it's like, okay, you take all the spices in the kitchen. I'll do all the bathroom cleaning products. And people were able to share and swap in pricing for the things that they had to get that information done. The next thing is just to be aware, protect yourself. Never intentionally claim items you did not have. If you make an innocent mistake, they're very common. It does not constitute fraud if you do that, but intentional misrepresentation is a felony. And so you wanna be very careful there. Um, you don't need to pad your claim in order to get a fair settlement. Um, and if you feel you have low ball pricing from your adjuster, don't go high, confront them very politely and assertively on uh, what the valuation is that they're giving you to get what you feel that you're due. And then being organized, so saving all receipts. We recommend that you scan or photograph them and email them so you have a copy for your records. You wanna document and track all of your claims communications. Uh, and then on our website at this, at this link, you have a, a tracking all contents payments uh, and a CPA who lost his home and, and actually the Woolsey Fire created this for us to share. Um, and one of the recommendations from a lot of survivors is op opening a separate bank account when replacing items so that you can track what you've bought versus what you're due. So you're able to easily do the math without a lot of effort. Okay, sorry about that. I'm gonna hang that phone up really fast. The one phone I did not catch, yes. Thanks Val, I appreciate it. So hello everyone. Um, let me just get this straight. I'm, I'm stealing, stealing Val's mouse here. Let's see. It's gonna let me do this. Let's see. Val, I seem to be battling with you a little bit here. All right, there we go. So, hello everyone. Again, my name is Mark Delman. Um, I'm the staff attorney at United Policyholders. Uh, as Val mentioned as well, uh, we miss not being able to be there with you in person. It's definitely different behind a behind a computer screen, but thank you all for being on. Thank you for joining us, and we hope that you can steal some um, useful tidbits. Um, before I begin my section and go into a little bit more of the nuts and bolts, um, I do want to just acknowledge and say that we understand. You know, people are at different parts um, of this recovery process. Whether you're a 2019 or 2018 survivor, whether you're on step one, step four, whether you've gotten to a settlement agreement with your insurance company, or whether whether you're still listing items, um, and that's okay. That is completely normal. There are folks are at different, um, different parts in their recovery process, and um, it's not anything to be worried about. Um, and I say that to preface because some of you, as you're, you're looking at this slide here, um, you've either heard um, the terms replacement cost and actual cash value about a thousand times at this point, um, or you may not have heard it at all. So we're gonna run through um, some of the basics, some of the terms, and some of the, um, how the sausage is made here um, on, the, on the other side of the, the contents inventory. So, um, so bear with me here. Um, your insurer will value your personal property and contents losses in um, two traditional ways. And there, there are these, these two terms, like I said, 
um, that you'll be hearing if you haven't heard them um, about 100 times already. Replacement cost and actual cash value, often um, heard said RC or ACB values. So the replacement cost is what it will take to replace that item new. Um, most policies do compensate you on a replacement cost value. You are owed the value to replace the item and that um, the, the amount that you're owed is the cost to replace it new um, you know, because oftentimes you cannot replace that, that four-year-old you know, pair of shoes in that condition. So it's um, uh, many policies and the standard is a replacement cost for most homeowners policies. Um, however, actual cash value is important to know um, for multiple reasons. Um, one, some policies do only pay actual cash value for contents and two, actual cash value as we'll discuss further um, in, this, in this presentation here um, is an important dollar figure that you're going to be dealing with even if you do have a replacement cost policy. So your actual cash value is the depreciated amount um, of what the value was of that piece of property the instant before the loss. Uh, we like to call it the Craigslist price. It is that four-year-old pair of shoes that I mentioned in their current condition, not what it costs to buy it new. So actual cash value is often defined as the replacement cost minus depreciation. And I'm a visual learner um, and I like to actually see things. Here's that in a, in a oops, just click over. Here's that in a, in a virtual form. So again, this is just showing uh, what I just went through, shows the replacement cost uh, silo, that one on the left there, you know, the cost to buy a new couch is equivalent to your actual cash value, the value of your couch an instant before um, the loss, uh, what you are owed before you repair or replace. Uh, we'll get to that shortly, um, plus that depreciation. So again, replacement costs equals either actual cash value plus depreciation, or you also often hear it as, actual cash value equals replacement cost minus depreciation. Um, either way, seeing that these two things are equal or should add up um, is the point we're trying to get across here. So you have a replacement cost policy. Why are they only paying you the actual cash value, that depreciated value? So most policies have a loss settlement provision and these specifically state that you are only owed that ACV, that actual cash value, that definition we were just talking about, that replacement cost minus the depreciation until the property is repaired or replaced. Um, to collect that full amount, to collect that amount that they withhold, that they depreciate, that they do not pay you upfront, um, that you're entitled to under your um, RC policy, you have to actually replace the items and often send the receipts to the insurer and then they will then send you the balance for that item. So here, I, I wanted to point out and go into the nuts and bolts of the policy um, so that you could, so you could see where and why it is that they're not actually um, paying you the replacement cost um, upfront. And again, it, you go into the loss settlement section of your policy. Oftentimes, you'll be able to find what page it is based on your declarations page that Val walked us through earlier. And here is the personal property section. And there are two, there are two um, circled sections here, B1 and B2. They're, um, they're almost like options. Your declarations page will determine and tell you if you have you know, B1 or B2. Every policy is a little bit different. This is a state farm law settlement provision um, example. So your policy may look a little bit different. It may or may not have options, but what state farm does is they list B1 and B2. And I want to point out a few important um, sections here and, and some important language. So the standard, again, is that replacement cost policy, which is shown under B1 here. So they'll pay the cost um, to repair or replace. And if you look at that first arrow next to one, until repairs or replacement is completed, you'll pay only the cost to repair or replace less depreciation. So two leads into also what we were just talking about after repairs or replacement is completed, they will pay the difference between the cost to repair or replace less depreciation and the cost you have actually and necessarily spent. Um, and three, if the property is not repaired or replaced within two years after the date of loss, we will pay only the cost to repair or replace less depreciation. So what that's saying, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit more, these timeframes imposed on collecting that difference between the actual cash value and RC, 
is that the policy imposes a two-year deadline to collect that withheld money. However, as we'll discuss in the, um, very shortly, actually, um, don't worry, that ex timeline is extended based on the California insurance codes. Um, and we will, again, we'll, we'll talk to that in just a moment. But I just want to outline that some things in your policy are um, overridden by, by, by statutes. So next, while, we, while I still have this section up, I would like to talk about that third red arrow um, on the left there. And it says, we will pay market value at the time of loss for antiques, fine arts, painting. Um, and then you go down and you'll see um, things like memorabilia, souvenirs, collector's item. Uh, this is important because not all items should be subject to depreciation. And again, this is something that we'll recap again soon when we're discussing how to negotiate fair depreciation. But it's important to look into your policy and see how your policy handles antiques and collectibles. Um, some items in your home shouldn't be subject to depreciation. They, you shouldn't have to have any money withheld from you for these items because they're actually appreciating. So look in your policy, see how it handles antiques, paintings, memorabilia. Um, and this is one place that, again, we'll talk about in, in just a moment, but one place where you can negotiate if there's any depreciation on those items. So we talked about we talked about the B1 and B2, and I just want to go back to the um, to the sample um, State Farm declarations page that Valerie had up earlier, and show you um, just a quick segment here of where it would show it if you had that B1 option, that replacement cost, or B2, the actual cash value. So this is the declarations page again. Just one example. Your policy might look different, <clears throat> but the bottom left is blown up here, and it shows law settlement provisions and highlights that this policy had B1, the limited replacement cost. So again, the next slide here is just another example, um, but, uh, and this is a renter's policy. There may not be too many renters on here. I'm, um, I'm actually not exactly sure what the, what, if there are how many homeowners, how many renters, but it, um, either way, it's an important point for, for both renters and homeowners. Um, sometimes your loss settlement provisions will, will set out that actual cash value is what's owed. Um, however, you might have an endorsement or an add-on to this to your policy um, at the, you know, it might be at the end of your policy that then changes the policy and says, no, you actually are owed replacement cost. Um, again, here, this is a renter's policy and a renter's example, uh, but it's applicable to both renters and homeowners insurance policies. So, and, and finally, to, to really drive the, the point home here um, as to why um, or how insurers are allowed to do it, the, the code also sets out that even if you have a replacement cost policy, um, that you still are able to be paid just the actual cash value until you replace those items. So for depreciation and why it matters. So depreciation, as, as we were just discussing, is the loss in value for an item of personal property from all causes, including age, wear, and tear, um, the diminution in value of that item. So why it matters, other than you being compensated your full benefits for a policy that you paid for and, and being owed those funds, is that coming up with the cash to buy the replacement items before you've been paid the full amount to actually replace them can be hard especially if your insurer has heavily depreciated your property. Um, this is especially true, the more depreciation um, that's applied and the more that you have to replace, uh, it's hard to come out of pocket. So we're gonna dive down um, a little bit deeper now into depreciation, um, how you can negotiate getting um, less depreciation on that contents list that uh, Valerie walked you through before and some other methods to maximize um, maximize returns here. Sorry. Let's see. Okay. So one of the biggest takeaways from this webinar, if you take almost nothing else, I, you know, I hope, I, I hope you do, but if you take nothing else, take away the fact that depreciation is negotiable. Um, the more depreciation your insurer applies, the less you collect up front the less likely it is that you collect it later. So if you have the time and, and energy um, to, to battle uh, on depreciation and depreciation percentages on certain items, um, it could be beneficial to how much you actually end up with um, at the end of the day regarding your claim payout. 
So it can be hard to pin down an adjuster on how they calculated depreciation, but it affects, affects your pocketbook at the end of the day. So if numbers, um, if they seem unfair, the depreciated numbers that they assign on your contents list, challenge them. Um, again, uh, as we noted earlier in the State Farm declarations page, or I'm sorry, the State Farm law settlement provisions, beware of items that should not be depreciated. When you get that contents um, list back from your insurer and they depreciate that antique, um, some of the fine art, go back, look to see what your policy says and say, hey, this, this is not an item that should be depreciated. Um, I want, you know, if it's a thousand dollar piece, they depreciated at 50% and only gave you 500, go back for that extra 500. Um, you should be entitled to that now. Um, also, ask in writing that your insurer give you a copy of the depreciated uh, the depreciation schedule or the method they used. Um, we're going to go through on the, on the next slide one of the regulations, but um, thought it was worth mentioning um, once, twice, maybe three times. Um, you know, ask questions, ask why certain things are happening um, regarding your, your policy, and remember that depreciation is negotiable. So um, I mentioned that we we're going to go into a reg and I apologize. Um, this is almost the verbatim language. Uh, I was able to cut out a little bit, but I just want to go through the most important parts of this. And you can find this, this is California Code of Regulations 2695.9F. Um, uh, this PowerPoint will be posted. So if you need to reference it later and run into any issues, um, you can find it here. Um, the, first, the first section, and these are broken up into paragraphs here. Um, where they're not in the code, but I, I wanted to separate some of the, the key distinctions in each sentence here. Um, so first, you know, the justifications must be contained in the claim file. The second paragraph um, mentioning adjustments um, and how they must be measurable and accurately reflect the depreciation. Third um, is one of the most important sections of the California Code of Regulations um, regarding homeowners insurance and content specifically. So, any adjustment for depreciation shall reflect a measurable difference in market value attributable to the condition and age of the property and apply only to property normally subject to repair and replacement during the useful life. So something I really want to highlight here is that this code section outlines that you must take both age and condition into account when figuring out the insurer must when um, determining depreciation. Um, oftentimes, um, the insurer will only look to age, and this is something we're going to talk about in the next slide as well. They'll only look to age, but the regulations clearly set out that both age and condition of the property must be considered. And this is extremely important and um, favorable language that is, it's not exclusive necessarily to California, but not all states put the same emphasis, especially in the regulations. So if you have an adjuster who's from out of state, and they're only assigning depreciation based on age, remind them of this section and remind them that condition also must be taken into account. Um, and then finally, the basis for any um, adjustment should be fully explained. And again, ask your adjuster why or how if you are unsure about how they um, arrived at a depreciation number or percentage. So again, age isn't everything. If there was the one takeaway um, that I mentioned before, it's that um, depreciation is negotiable. If there's a second takeaway, age isn't everything. Um, as I mentioned, this is the code section for you again. Um, it's age and condition. Even if the item was old, it may have been in good condition. Even if an item is new, it cuts both ways. Even if an item was new, it may not have been in good condition. So you can argue um, that the depreciation should have been based on remaining life expectancy, uh, but not the age of the item if you see something that doesn't seem fair or you see that they're holding on to dollars that you think you're owed now. Um, at the end of the day, only you know um, the condition of the items that were destroyed. Uh, so go to friends, go to family, you know, does anyone have pictures of the items? Can you substantiate that, you know, your couch was in good condition? Can you substantiate, um, you know, can, can you explain to them that you had habits, um, you know, you, you kept your furniture in good shape, you kept your shoes pristine, you kept, um, you know, anything of that nature where you can show that you had habits where, um, oh, thank you, you had, you had habits that, um, you know, your property might have been, been in better condition than just age alone reflects. 
So, so again, so Mark, let me interrupt here. So, so one of the things to think would be, uh, Mark was talking about clothing. So if you, you know, you, you attended a semi-formal, formal event every year, your tux, your tux might be 12 years old. It's in almost new condition. Uh, you know, if you, if uh, ladies, if you're, if you, if you bought dresses for those uh, holiday parties and things like that, you wore them once or twice, they were almost new. And so you want to argue for the condition matters more than the age of that. Absolutely. Thanks, Val. And, um, and that kind of goes to this next slide too. And I, and I get a chuckle out of this slide, but it really is such a, um, such a simple concept that this image captures um, so much better than me rambling about it on the last slide. And um, so based on age and condition, you know, we, we have these folks, a family with no children, five-year-old sofa, maybe should only be depreciated 20%. It reminds me of my grandmother. She was um, one of the people who put the plastic wrap over the couch. I think that the couch probably was in better condition after she bought it and had it for a couple of years than when she first bought it. I swear she, you know, it, it got cleaner by the year. Um, and the picture on the right here, family with kids and pets, this reminds me of my house growing up. And, um, you know, we probably destroyed a, a couple sofas in the, in the first year or two. So maybe depreciation um, is reasonable uh, 80%. Again, same age couch, the condition makes all the difference. If that's a thousand dollar couch, that's the difference between getting $800 up front or $200 up front. So um, again, a very important concept in moving forward and looking through your contents list, and making sure that you're getting um, all the dollars owed to you. Um, so as, as we're, we're harping on this issue, so it shouldn't be a surprise that excessive depreciation is a common claim problem. Um, don't accept the excessive depreciation. Um, it, it, you know, it's as simple as that, it, you, know, you can negotiate um, depreciation guides can help you determine the value of your contents. Again, depreciation guides that other people make, you know, won't represent or reflect the condition of your property, but they can give you a baseline to see um, how similar property is often depreciated. So, um, you know, hard goods um, might depreciate slower, you know, hardwood items um, will depreciate slower than that pair of sneakers, soft goods, um, and things of the like. You know, Val, you mentioned that, you know, the tuxedo, the, there are certain examples where um, if, if it, you know, a tuxedo might be a, is a soft good that might not depreciate as fast as some of the other clothes in your closet. So there are differences and a standard um, straight line formula is not going to apply to all of them. So visit um, uphelp.org slash samples. Um, in, in that, um, through that link, we do have a few depreciation schedules that you might find very helpful in serving as um, a guide to, to making sure that depreciation is being uh, applied fairly in, in your situation. So resolving a dispute, again, you have the ability to depreciate on a case-by-case -case basis, an item-by-item -item basis. Sorry. <laughs> Um, if your insurer um, applies a fixed percentage across all items, which is more, more rare, but it, it does happen, um, you can do two things. You can push back against this method and request that items are individually uh, depreciated. Um, that's really how they should be depreciated on, on your contents list. Or if it happens to look like it's a favorable um, depreciation across the board, um, you can negotiate that number and perhaps you know, decrease that to, you know, from 30% across the board to 20% across the board. That might be um, more favorable for your situation. So just two options there. Um, make specific requests to what you feel is fair and reasonable and back it up. Um, use receipts, use photos, again, use habits, you know, use friends. Um, backing, backing it up is going to be the best way to convince your insurer that you're owed more and that they should cut you a check um, for dollars that you're owed right now. Um, you know, if, if it starts progressing, these three get a, are increasingly um, problematic situations, you know, go up the chain of command at the insurance company. Again, we have a publication that will kind of outline, you know, how to do that, how to communicate with your insurer. Um, if it goes further, you know, file a complaint with the, the California Department of Insurance is an option. And then um, we hope it doesn't come to this, but mediation and or litigation is is an option if you still feel like you're being treated unfairly. So, oops, sorry. We're, we're playing cat and mouse with the, we're, we're getting used to the, sh the sharing the mouse here. So thank you for bearing with us. So collecting all available policy benefits. I wanna shift focus to 
um, collecting. So once you have once you have negotiated your your policy, I mean, excuse me, negotiated your contents list and gotten um, a co contents estimate, um, collecting those benefits, collecting that withheld dollars. So again, we know that they depreciate um, depreciate your goods. Um, a few of the terms that you may hear this um, this depreciation um, referred to uh, are holdback, withheld, recoverable depreciation, or if you have an ACV policy, perhaps non-recoverable depreciation. So those terms, for the most part, other than the non-recoverable depreciation, um, are, are used synonymously um, quite often. So for items that are covered under replacement cost value. Um, unless your insurer relaxes or waives the requirement, as we mentioned, you often have to replace and actually submit proof to actually receive um, that withheld money back, that, that depreciation amount back. So let's see. Moving forward on that, let's see. Perfect. All right. So, um, yeah, three three pretty important um, um, words. Yeah, time, effort, and patience. So, what we're going to go through next is not for everyone, but if you have the time, effort, and patience, this is really an area that um, recovering this withheld is, is something where you can make up some dollars um, that you are owed that oftentimes are not collected, and knowing the right ways to do that um, are important. So, first, it doesn't hurt. The worst they can say is no. That's um, always what our executive director Amy Box says. The worst they can say is no, um, but if you don't ask, you'll never know. So ask for a waiver of the inventory itemization requirement. Um, it can't hurt. If that's a no, request 75% of contents payout. 75% um, might not be what you ultimately want to collect. You might want 100%, but if you're in a situation where 75% works for you, it doesn't hurt to ask. It's an option. So best practices, if you must itemize and the insurer holds back depreciation, um, again, yeah, don't accept excessive depreciation or across the board if it doesn't work for you. Again, condition matters, not just age. Check out our samples. Um, work with your adjuster or if need be a contents expert or someone else to help you inventory and negotiate that, um, that contents list. And um, these next two points are the two, they're two of the smallest points here, but they're two of the most important. Perhaps they, they should have been the, you know, the, the biggest text on the screen. Um, Val mentioned it before, as you shop and replace items that were damaged, keep your receipts um, as, as you replace things, keep them organized. Um, this is extremely important in um, a recovery that takes a little bit of time um, because sometimes receipts are not um, always the most clear about what the item was. So if you're going to the store and you're shopping for something that you're replacing in the house that was damaged, um, Take the receipt, you know, you might go to Target, you might buy a $25 shirt, but instead of listing um, that you purchased a shirt, it might have a number, uh, you know, a SKU number. After you go shopping, if you can, you know, take a pen, make a little note. What was that item? Keep that receipt, keep it in one place, keep a diary if you can. Um, again, this is, it's very burdensome and it's a, you know, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And I know that I'm, I'm talking to the folks here who um, who know that it's we're a year or we're two years out, depending on, on which loss. So, so please, if you haven't been doing that, um, start doing it now, keep good records. Um, and then second, um, keep uh, shop, keeping the agreed upon contents estimate close by. And um, we'll go into an example um, and, and in depth a little bit more in just a moment. But what I mean is once you do submit your contents inventory list, um, some of you may not be there yet, um, once you negotiate that list and get an agreed upon contents estimate from your insurer, use that list to shop to maximize the benefits that, that you can receive back to you. And, and we'll go through that in, in a little bit more detail here next. So here um, I wanted to show and illustrate a kind of a timeline of, of what I was just talking about. So don't pay attention to the, to the numbers or the items. This is just an example. So the top list is supposed to be representative of your list. This may be a handwritten list. It may be in Excel where you went through and you listed your items. You listed the quantity lost in your home. Um, you listed the, the age of the items. Um, and you listed the condition of the items 
and you listed a replacement cost, um, similar to what Valerie walked you through before. So next in this timeline is the negotiation. You saw that a couple items that weren't depreciated uh, or that were depreciated highly shouldn't have been depreciated. You saw that the antiques were depreciated and you said, hey, these shouldn't be depreciated. You, you got your, um, they, they adjusted it. You fixed the uh, depreciation amount on that tuxedo that shouldn't have been depreciated that highly. And you got to an agreed upon, um, an, an, an agreed upon inventory from your insurer. And now this is what I, I like to call it, um, the cookbook. Um, this is what you're gonna wanna use. It has your recipe for shopping. And that's what I'm going to be discussing um, as we move forward here. This is your agreed upon estimate, contents estimate that you should use moving forward as you replace your items. So up here. Uh, thank you. So, um, so again, that last agreed upon estimate, um, I like to call it the, the cookbook, as I mentioned, because it, um, it has a recipe to maximizing your benefits, shopping using the numbers and the items in that, in that, um, that agreed upon scope um, will help you, you know, make that best dish. Uh, but just like a cookbook, it has, it has the recipe, but you can still veer off the recipe and still have something that's going to help you. You know, that dish can still come out well. So, um, so when I use the term cookbook, that's what I'm talking about, the agreed upon scope. Um, so use the recipe as a guideline. But again, if you're not following it exactly, it's impossible to follow it exactly. Um, just know that that's there to, to guide you the way. So I wanted to walk through um, an example of um, how the payout process works um, when trying to recover the amount, um, the most withheld money that you can, or just so that you have an understanding so that as you shop, you can, you can maximize your benefits here. So the scenario here again is assuming that you have gone through, you've itemized your contents, you've gotten to an agreed upon amount, you've, got, um, you've gotten your cookbook, you've gotten your actual cash value payment, and now you're collecting other benefits and now you're shopping. So that's the, <clears throat> that's the situation that, that this next example is. Assuming, I know that not everyone is here yet, but it's important to know so that when you do get there. So first I wanna start off looking at the personal property estimate. So look, let's look at that first box. The, the red circle there highlights which, which initial uh, rectangular box I'm talking about there. And um, I'm using an example with two items, a bath towel and a Roomba. So let's go through the bath towel first. Um, your insurer has agreed that the replacement cost of your bath towel is $18.08. I apologize for the odd numbers. These are um, actual examples. I wanted to show what it actually looked like. So $18.08. The actual cash value, if you follow that down, is $7.23. So the amount of money that you can still potentially receive back from your insurer that you are potentially, that you are owed if you collect it properly is $10.85. It doesn't mean that you necessarily will get that, but it depends on how you shop. So let's go down to the second box, the receipt example. And again, let's look at the bath towel. So, so you went down, um, you went to Target and you bought a bath towel, um, a, a, similar, a similar type of bath towel, and you're matching it up with this, this line item in your contents cookbook. So you purchased that bath towel for $15.15. So you went, to, you went to the store, you got the receipt, you marked that it was for a bath towel, you put it in your filing system, you're keeping, you're keeping your records, you're keeping the diary. And now let's go down, let's go down here to, to, do some, to some accounting. And again, we're gonna look at that, that purple arrow on the, um, the screen grab there on the bottom. So it says towel, it says the RC amount is 1808, the actual replacement cost, the original cost, which is the cost that you just um, spent to replace that towel. And the amount recoverable, if you'll notice, is $8.27. Your insurer, now that you've furnished them this receipt, they owe you $8.27. Now, this is not the $10.85 that you could have recovered. Um, it's a little bit, it's a little bit less than that amount. And what I want to illustrate here is um, the point on the bottom is that the amount of money that you are owed is the lesser of the cost to buy the item new or the agreed upon replacement cost value. So 
you did pretty well here. You recovered most of the money. You didn't go over. That's not dollars out of your pocket. You have a towel, but there could have been, you could have purchased the towel for another, you know, dollar fifty if you found a similar, a similar towel and recovered that extra benefit as well. So again, you can, you're only recovering the amount that you purchased the towel for if it is under that replacement cost value. So now I wanna go over to the Roomba and we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna start at the top with that top, um, the yellow arrow on the top right. So the replacement cost for the Roomba out of your cookbook that you and your insurer agreed upon was $478.58. The actual cash value must have been a relatively new and good condition Roomba was $430.72. So the estimated remaining um, dollars that you can recover, $47.86. So again, you go shopping. We're going down to the box now with the green circle and you kept, you went shopping at Target again, your favorite store, and you purchased a Roomba for $499.99. And now we're gonna go down to the bottom box again. We're gonna look at that Roomba. The RC value was $478.58. You paid $499.99. If you look at the amount recoverable, you're gonna see that it is $47.86, the same as the maximum estimated remaining. So you max out the amount of dollars that you can recoup by buying the Roomba. However, because it was over $478, you had to spend the difference between the, the $499.99 and the $478.58. So just over $20 came out of your pocket. So I hope you were able to follow along um, again, I just wanted to illustrate how shopping close to that um, to that cookbook um, will allow you at the at the margins to recover as much as possible, not leave dollars on the table, but also not overspend on an item so that you're paying for it out of pocket. Again, we understand you're not going to replace everything exactly how it was in your house. You're absolutely entitled to upgrade or buy something of lesser value. Um, most people do for many of the items. I just wanna point out if there are items that you wanna place close, look at that agreed upon estimate. All right. So the reality check and the reality is we just went through all that and that seems awfully cumbersome, um, time consuming. And to be quite frank, not everyone has the time or patience to minimize depreciation or to maximize the claim, the, the depreciation payout. So if you do have the capacity, this is an avenue for extra dollars and avoids leaving money on the table. Um, this is especially important for those who might be underinsured and withheld dollars are available. Um, so it's, I think it's good to know that you also don't have to do it for every item. You can do it on the high value items. You can target large purchases to maximize there and don't have to worry necessarily about the um, tube of toothpaste uh, and maximizing that value when you have higher items. So there is a happy medium. Um, and some total loss victims work on their contents list over a year or two. Like I said, I, we know everyone is at a different stage and that is perfectly that is perfectly okay. So is there a time limit to collecting replacement cost benefits? The answer is yes. And that can be found in the code at 2051.5. And long story short here, is that they cannot, the insurer cannot impose a time limit of less than 36 months from the date that the first payment towards the actual cash value is made. So remember before we looked in the law settlement provisions and it said that you had two years to collect this withheld to submit those receipts or you were only entitled to the actual cash value. This for 2018 um, and beyond extends to 36 months and overrides the policy language. So 36 months, however, um, is also uh, not a lot of time to replace an entire house um, worth of furniture and personal property. So if you need more time, the code says, an insurer shall provide to a policyholder one or more additional extensions of six months for good cause. So keep in contact with your insurer. If you anticipate needing more time as you approach um, these deadlines, let your company know it's in writing as soon as possible. Um, good cause, we find just, you know, as much communication as you can. Let them know that you're trying to replace. Let them know, you know, you might have been going from rental to rental. You might have been moving. You might have been in a smaller house than you were previously. 
um, while you rebuild. Um, document these reasons, let your insurer know so that if you do need these additional extensions to collect that withheld uh, or depreciated amount, um, that your insurer will, or you'll have good reason when asking your insurer to do so. All right. I believe you don't have to hear me talking about insurance codes um, or, or regs um, next. So I believe I'm handing it back off to you, Val. Thank you. Sorry, I moved the slide when I unmuted. So just we want you to be strategic. It's not like you you are, want to or have to replace everything you lost. Uh, it's a hassle to keep doing this. So the the, the biggest uh, takeaway is to be strategic and maximize. Uh, your ACV payments, you know, argue for lower depreciation, especially on those big ticket items, and identifying the true replacement costs at standard retailers, not a discount, not, a, not on sale. So that, and then when you're replacing things, replacing things that you know, are, are in your plan, but also are the things that you're wanting and that are, that are high enough value to be able to cap, capture those extra dollars so you can maximize what you, what you have, the funds that you have available. Best practices for communication, get everything in writing. You know, as we always say, document, because if you didn't document, it didn't happen. Um, so if the initial communication is not in writing, if you talk to your adjuster on the phone uh, or you met with them in person, put it in writing back to them to confirm your understanding. Always have that paper trail. Use your journal, use notes, use email, whatever it takes. Just make sure that you capture in writing what your understanding is. Keep it professional be concise and to the point. It's always helpful to bullet or bulge your request. Um, and part of it's just that, you know, bear in mind that your investors uh, are, are handling lots of claims. And so the easier and clearer you can make it for them to understand what you want, the more likely they are to act on it when they see it versus putting it aside to deal with it later, uh, using proper, uh, proper grammar, punctuation, responding promptly when they reach out to you with letters, with reasonable requests, and avoid venting your frustrations and your emotions to the, your adjuster, their people. Um, you know, they don't get them tied up and, and irritated at you. Your frustration is valid, and, and I'm sure they understand that, but they don't necessarily like being a punching bag. So, you know, share your frustrations and, and venting your emotions with with the people in your family and your in your in your life that, that care and can absorb that and try not to put that on your adjuster just to keep that relationship professional again. And tolerance, the biggest thing here is no one knows what your tolerance is for this process but you. Um, I, I had a friend who, who lost an 07 who took her 75% payout and didn't look back and didn't care. I had another friend who lost an 03 who literally for six years, because she kept extending it every six months, kept pushing and submitting things. Um, and, and I've got a friend who still keeps track. You know, it's like, oh, I had this and he'll send it. They're not going to pay. He just, he wants to be precise. Um, so, you know, it depends on you, what your, what your tolerance is, what your financial needs are. Um, but, but it's knowing what's best, best for you and your family and your finances. Um, one of our uh, uh, Thomas Fire families, uh, she and her husband had newly retired right before they lost their home. And she said she treated her contents list like a paycheck because neither one of them had a paycheck at that point. And she said, every page I did, I got paid for. And so she, she kind of flipped the paradigm of how she looked at tackling her inventory and turned it from a negative of you know, looking at, at what was lost into a financial and business transaction. And, and, and treated it just like it was a job. And it was, a, it was not necessarily her favorite job, but it was a, it was a job that, that ensured that she got paid. And so she, in taking that mindset, she was able to maximize her claim. So again, what works for you, knowing what your tolerance is and, and what you can handle. And if, of course, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to the California Department of Insurance. You can call them, you can go online. Uh, they'll provide a, you can put in a request for assistance or just ask them a question. Uh, again, thank you to our funders. Um, and um, Mark, I'm gonna quit sharing my screen and we'll take some questions. Perfect, so I believe, so I see two here in the queue. And so, so Mark, I'm, I'm going to, um, 
I'm going to summarize a little bit and paraphrase your question, but I, I hope we can get to the to the bottom of it here. Um, basically, it seems it seems that you were working on on providing information and working on your contents um, for quite some time, and you recently reached out and asked what they had um, uh, regarding your content claim. Um, it seems like you asked a very detailed um, question and we're hoping to get some information from them. And their response was that they do not have any detailed information for the content portion of your claim and there's nothing in the file. Um, seems like they've only paid out 50% of your inflation of your adjusted um, policy limit as, and it seems as if they would have given you that regardless if you supplied them anything. Um, is it normal for them not to have a record of what I submitted in the adjuster and I worked on? So, so no, uh, um, long story short, no, you, you should absolutely be entitled um, to know what they have in, in the claim folder. If you have been sending them, um, if you have been sending them things and correspondence that should have been added to your claim, um, absolutely follow up. I, I hope this communication um, was in writing. If it wasn't in writing, follow up again and ask, um, I'm looking right now. I, I'm trying to recall if it's in um, minimal. Uh, yeah, I mean they, they should they should have whatever you've given them because if making if they're saying that they've they've done an adjustment to your claim, um, you know they're they're you you're within bounds and they should be able to provide you what their depreciation what depreciation they've applied to it, and um, you know so so Mark I would push on that and if you don't get an answer on that. That is, that is a great way to go to the Department of Insurance uh, because you can they can actually request that they pull your whole file. And so that you, 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 you it kind of uh, puts a little impetus on them to get moving. Um, I'm, also, I'm also looking, you know, I, I'd agree with that, Val, and I'm, I'm looking to see, and I cannot recall if the insurance code section 2071 um, applies for a written status report or an update of your claim file. It may only apply with the three adjusters um, within a six month period. I apologize here. I'll, yeah, I'll keep looking for that. And, and Mark, we have the question. So we'll get, we'll get back to you on that. But, um, but there should be, uh, you should be entitled to a status update on your claim file, especially if you've been submitting, um, submitting documentation and correspondence on that. But I will look. I will keep looking for that code section um, and and verify. So let's see. So let's let's jump to the uh, Mark. Why don't you take the value of hiring a public adjuster to assist with this and how one should choose one? Sure. So um, so this is this is another one of those questions where it very much so depends on your situation um, as to whether or not a, a public adjuster is the right fit for you. So first thing to know off the bat is that a public adjuster often will take a percentage of the payout um, that, that they obtain for you. Um, there are ranges, you know, seven to 15%, uh, you know, is one rate. So depending on the situation, a certain range might be um, more reasonable than not, but they will help. Um, they are experienced in actually um, documenting contents, claims, and helping to recover um, withheld. Um, so if you are in a situation where, um, you know, you are not underinsured and need to squeeze every penny out of your policy that you can, or you feel like it's an overwhelming task, um, considering hiring a public adjuster uh, can really help because they will do a lot of the footwork. Um, they will take a lot of the time. They know how to do it um, at, at, of course, at a fee. Um, in choosing one, we do have a find help directory. Again, we don't specifically um, in, endorse um, and, and do not do so, but we have quite a quite of um, core volunteers and sponsors on our website um, that we recommend. So go to uphelp.org and you'll see our find help directory um, can help you find um, at least a starting point. All right, so Scott had asked a question about uh, conditions. Let me, that we're gonna answer it live. Uh, relocation to a smaller house, change of interest and in activities or economic situation. Um, does that automatically put the insured in the ACV? Um, you know, that's one of the reasons uh, we always suggest to people that you, you argue for the, you know, the 75%. And, and I think the insurance commissioner had actually in 2008 had recommended that for insurers to, to make that. Not all of them did, of course, but 
um, for those that did take advantage of that. And then you're looking to replace those items that fit your situation that are going to maximize your claim. So if you've got a payout of 75%, then you're looking at um, making sure that you're spending dollars on those items that are going to capture that additional 25% you have available in your claim. Looking at your the list that you've submitted. Um, it, and you know, change of interest, um, you know, you can, you can make that argument for them. Um, you know, one of the things would be if when you're, if you're downsizing, it might be that you're, um, you're, you're, you're making that argument that um, I had this and I'm going here, but I'd like to basically combine these into that. Um, Mark, anything to add on that? Because I know you've done quite a few of these with your dad. Yeah, I, I would say that this is, this is common. Um, you know, put in right, especially the downsizing. Um, something I want to emphasize is that when replacing items, it doesn't have to be the exact same item. Um, it can be, uh, you know, like kind and quality. And that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, if, if you um, liked hiking before and you no longer go hiking and you don't buy a tent that you can, that you can, you know, get a tuxedo instead, that that's not going to, that's not going to mesh. But there are items that are similar, um, you know, that you may be able to say, hey, I replaced this item for that item. So that's, that's one option on a, a between items that are somewhat similar. Um, something else to consider, and again, this is not something that the insurer is obligated to do by any means, but something that um, I've seen personally a couple times is you might, you know, once you have replaced the majority of the items on your list and you think that the, you know, there, you may or may not replace a, um, a chunk of other items and are trying to replace or have, you know, say $50,000 worth of withheld monies or depreciated dollars available. And you might only be able to recover 20,000 based on the size of your home um, and, and other factors. You can, you can reach out and ask. Again, it doesn't hurt to ask. The worst they can say is no. Ask for a buyout. Um, they may be willing to negotiate and say, okay, we'll give you $10,000 to close out the rest of the claim. Um, you know, it, sometimes it's, it's more, you know, depending on the search, the situation and the economic situation as well, it's more likely um, than others, but sometimes adjusters will work with you. Um, that's a negotiation um, just like everything else here. So the worst they can say is no, um, you have to furnish us receipts. But it's an option if they see you might be leaving dollars on the table um, to just close out the claim. And that goes for anyone, whether or not you're um, replacing items or not. Um, you know, it doesn't hurt to ask to um, an insurer for a buyout. Some have internal policies where they will not. But again, we've seen um, quite a few where insurers have agreed um, to do so. All right, let's see what we have. So Ryan was asking about where does... California sales tax fit into purchased items. And so let me see, I wish I, I, wish I had left the, um, the other contents list up. Um, sales tax is, there should be um, included in that, um, in that estimate that's written. It should be one of the factors of replacement cost. And oftentimes it's broken out into its own separate category. You'll have replacement cost for $10. You'll have taxes, um, you know, whatever it comes out to be, the total is, you know, 1150. Um, so that is factored in and you are owed um, the cost to actually replace that item. All right, let's see. So Carla um, with USAA. Um, so if, so with your friend, um, if you have the same adjuster, they're probably saying the same story. Um, I, but I would check with your adjuster to see what it is they want. I can see them wanting a partial list. So the question was that USA said she needed to get a partial list before the two year anniversary. Um, and then our slide said three years. So, so you know, if, if your adjuster and your policy has language, you need to honor that. You can always ask for um, modification or extension. Uh, but I can see at the two year mark, them at least wanting something. And we, I mean, the reality is you could, um, you could use one of the samples that we have to just build something if you haven't. Um, Carolyn uh, will be uh, sharing some links. I'm not quite sure how, because I thought we could do it in the chat. I mean, in the, in the, the Q&A, but we can't, uh, of some publications we have that have some pricing that would at least give you something that you could do. Mark, anything to add there? Yeah, I just want to, this doesn't go directly to the question, but I do want to make an important um, distinction about the three-year time frame, So there is a difference between the amount of time you have to submit 
the inventory, which may be asked of your adjuster, and the amount of time you have to um, collect the withheld. So you have three years from the first payment of actual cash value on your claim to collect the withheld and depreciation, and then that can be extended for six month periods. Um, in terms of submitting an inventory, yeah, you're gonna wanna work with your adjuster and not use the three years as a crutch. Again, constant communication, showing that you're making efforts um, and really keep that, keep that open line with them um, because there are other um, policy provisions that, as you mentioned, Val, that, that require you to um, submit updated information that may not be adjusted by statute. So um, yeah. work with and, them. Yeah, and, and, and one other thing to follow up, uh, Mark, Mark's question earlier that they had not provided him information, he had submitted quite a substantial amount. Um, don't hesitate to turn in a partial list, even if it's just a page at a time, uh, just to be making progress. But please make sure you're keeping copies. And then uh, like Mark, uh, Mark, the, the, um, our, our Woolsey friend here had, had mentioned, um, you know, at, make, the, make the point of asking them, you know, what they're, how they're depreciating it, what they have in their records. Because as Mark, Mark Dillman mentioned earlier, in his examples on the PowerPoint, you know, that becomes your shopping list. And so you want to know what they've got after you've negotiated and you've agreed and you've vetted and you've made sure it's accurate. Um, so, yeah, one more question. So Heather with Nationwide with Replacement Home, we actually did a webinar like a month or so ago on this topic about a uh, replacement home and, and to be able to get that replacement cost. Um, so uh, we'll find the link for that and we'll share it with you in the, in the Q and A. Okay. Um, any other questions? Let me go through that. Let me do a quick scan here. Yeah, if there's any clarification needed as well, please let us know. Throw it into the chat now. Yeah, Bill. Bill just br brought up a question. Oh, yeah. We get two questions. Let's see. Okay. So. So. Okay. So. So Bill said State Farm um, told us they would reimburse 100% of the replaced item if we furnish a receipt. Um, yes, that is correct. If you furnish a receipt for an item and um, they will usually make you spend up to that amount. Um, they will then, they should then reimburse you as we went through with the example up to the lesser of either the cost of that item or the replacement cost value. So um, in theory, yes. Also the ALE section. So, okay, so this, this second part here goes towards the ALE section of the policy. Um, so yeah, so you should, so, so the ALE, it's a, um, um, again, we, I'm trying to think of the last webinar that we talked specifically on ALE and we can send something to you as well and then please follow up in more detail. But, um, but yes, your ALE is meant to put you in the position, um, the same living standard that you had before the loss. So if, um, some insurers, they will uh, work with you um, to make sure that your house, that your renting is the equivalent, if, if that means fully furnished, you can negotiate that with them what, to what extent. Um, but again, I would say talk to your adjuster and, um, and find out what their stance is on it. We also do what we'll follow up and direct you towards our last um, webinar where we discussed ALE in a little bit more depth. And, and you're within bounds, Bill, to ask them for um, a, a list of what they, uh, what they will include in ALE. Um, they, they should have something and, and you're within bounds to ask and, and get it in, you know, try to get it in writing to see what they've got. All right, and then inflation protection. It's Mark, can you, no, you know what he's talking about. Yeah, I see it, I, and I appreciate it. So, so Carolyn, I want to say thank you. She's in the background and, and helping us um, manage some of these questions coming in. And I see that, that Mark, I want to thank you as well to remind people to check if they have inflation protection on their content. Um, so you just found out that you have it on all portions of your policy. And it, and 
yeah, it increased your limit. So it may make a 75% payout more palatable. So yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Oftentimes inflation guards um, or inflation protection in general is something that you'll find on your declarations page. And it usually just applies, I shouldn't say usually, it oftentimes applies just to cover J. Um, but the fact that there are some policies that exist where it does apply to coverage C as well um, is extremely important to point out. So thank you. Yeah, please check your policies. So Bill asked, uh, showing your rent receipt for, um, and I'm, I'm missing the other question, the other part of the question, sorry, Mark, to you. I believe this is the follow-up on the ALE. Um, yeah, Bill, I definitely would encourage you to check out the, the, ALE, um, the ALE webinar that we have posted. Um, usually you do have to furnish, you do have to furnish uh, that you're paying rent and show, show them that, that usually you'll agree beforehand, they'll um, agree on a rental um, with you. You will show and you will furnish your, either you know, the, the check that you submitted or some kind of invoice. Um, if you purchase a temporary house, this gets a little bit dicey. This is somewhere where, um, again, you're going to want to make sure before you take action and, and buy a temporary house instead of rent somewhere that you have an agreement. Maybe they'll um, agree to pay you fair market value for your home. Some policies include that in the policy. Um, some are less clear. So um, again, yeah, it all goes it's negotiation. A lot of it's negotiation. So a lot of people do buy or replace a temporary house. Um, and, but they've negotiated before they get that, they make that commitment. They've got a negotiation and a, an agreement with the insurer that they're going to pay that fair market value or the equivalent of what it would have cost to rent for a certain period. Sometimes they'll cash them out. Um, and, and, and a lot of it's just what kind of case can you make for buying that the, the, the temporary house? Is it going to maximize your ALE because you're going to, um, it's going to take longer to rebuild? So, you know, part of it's having that case that you're making as well for that. And there is a, um, uh, as Mark said, there's an ALE webinar. And so I'm looking for those links now. I'll try to put those in the q and I believe, I believe one was sent out for that, but, but yes. So let's see. Okay. All right. All right. You're welcome, Bill. Thank you. Thank you for being on. All right. Thank you. And, um, Heather, I will find that for you. Um, we're, if you just go ahead and send an email to info at uh, uphelp.org, we'll find, um, uh, if, there's a, if there's a webinar we've referenced that you can't find on the website, please uh, just send us an email and we'll find it for you, okay? A lot of things are on our YouTube and unfortunately we did a lot at the end of August and then uh, the 2020 fires happened and so um, think a lot of things just weren't quite there. So um, any more questions? I, I, I know we've ran a little longer than we like to, but I wanted to make sure we get everybody's questions answered. Uh, if not, um, thank you for being here. It's really hard not 